Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Leadership Now with me, Dan Pontifrac. Today in the house, wow, good friend, widely known as the tech humanist, Kate O'Neill. Hello. Founder, yeah. CEO of KO Insights, a strategic advisory firm committed to improving the human experience at scale through more meaningful and aligned strategy. Kate is helping humanity, period, but also preparing for an increasingly high-tech driven future and is doing so through her signature strategic optimism. If you're watching this, you'll see her smile incessantly today. A prior Among her prior roles, sorry, she created the first content management role at Netflix, developed Toshiba America's first intranet, and founded MetaMarketer, one of the first digital strategy and analytic agencies. She's appeared as an expert tech commentator on BBC, NPR, and a wide variety of international media, and has written insights that have been featured in Wired, CMO.com, and many other outlets. And she's worked with many different global companies, including the likes of Google, Etsy, Cisco, to what? Well, yeah, you know, to optimize the role technology plays in the modern world to make it more human. Her books have included the likes of Tech Humanist, Pixels in Place, and our latest is A Future So Bright. Kate, it's so great to see you. So great for you to be here. Thank you, my friend. First doozy question for you. What the heck is a tech humanist? Tell us. <laughs> well, first of all, thank you so much for having me on your show and and uh, having the opportunity to see you, my friend. It's uh, so nice to see your face and to interact with all of your your people who are who are tuned in and listening. Uh, tech humanism I coined a few years back uh, as the idea that you know we we um, we center the hum the human in the relationship between technology and humanity. Like when we think about that relationship, that we really want to be con conscious of centering the human, but even more. More so when you think about how technology comes to market, it's always through a business objective. And mm. so I, I think about the sort of trifecta, the three part relationship between business, technology and humanity. And I still want to see humans at the center in that equation as well. So I, I constantly speak with uh, business leaders and tech leaders. Uh, other organizational leaders, city leaders, governmental leaders, trying to get them to think about, you know, kind of business objectives in the small b, like, you know, whatever your organizational objectives are and what you're trying to use technology to do. Let's not forget to think about the, the people that are part of the organization that are on the other side of the organization that are all around the organization in the community and so on that are going to be affected by how we roll out technology. You know, Kate, when I'm bored, like really bored, I'll go back and look at some of my previous writing and see where my thoughts have evolved or my thinking has actually, you know, gotten better. In 2010, which is the year of the Vancouver Olympics, of which I went to basically every event, I wrote a piece called Maybe the CIO and the CHRO's Role Should Merge. And my argument, which is now 13 years later, was, and still is actually, that the CIO, uh, he or she has to do a better job of thinking about the humanity of the organization, the, you know, the empathy, the leadership, the what makes us tick, what where our emotions come from. Whereas on the CHRO side, you know, they probably and still probably have to do a better job at, well, how does the technology impact the worker, the workplace, the customer, the organization, the community, et cetera? So my question for you is, where do you sit on that spectrum? It's not, I'm not asking you if the role should align, but what should, should the CIO and the CHRO be doing anything different these days to get to sort of that tech humanism uh, modality that you're, you're getting at? Yeah, you know, it's, it's what a prescient view you had back in 2010. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's I'm just old. Really... <laughs> I'm just old, Kate. That's all it is. <laughs> no, old and smart, I guess. <laughs> no, I think that's a, a brilliant observation. In fact, um, I think one of the ways in which your work and mine align, Dan, is that we both talk a lot about purpose. And I think in both cases, with the CIO role and the CHRO role, you know, what they fundamentally come down to does have to do with purpose. I, I when I talk about purpose, I'm often talking about it from the standpoint of uh, deriving that from meaning, meaning I, I find is the sort of central human condition. It, it's when you think about what really makes us human, as in distinct from other animals, as in distinct from machines so far. <laughs> right, it, yeah, so far. <laughs> so far. Uh, so far, it is, to, to my mind, it all comes down to 
we crave meaning. We seek meaning. We thrive on meaning. We ask and answer questions about meaning all the time. And I want I'm talking about meaning, everything from, you know, sort of a semantic view of meaning, you know, communication, all the way out through patterns and purpose and and truth and significance, all the way out to like the most macro existential view of uh, cosmic and existential meaning. Like, why are we here and what's it all about? Mm-hmm. And I think when you think about those in the context of the CIO role, you know, you can think about the data as a way of determining what is meaningful to an organization. What should we be measuring throughout an organization to determine what would be our most meaningful decisions and where can we make our most meaningful alignments and how can we tune most meaningfully with what we're trying to accomplish as an organization? What's our purpose as an organization? How can we gain the meaningful insights we need in order to make more meaningful decisions? So uh, that's probably a record for the most times the word meaning has been said on your show in a a one minute span. But so on the other side, of course, the CHRO role is so focused on meaning at a human uh, contribution level and thinking about how do workers feel like they're making a contribution? How do they genuinely make a contribution? How do we value that contribution? How do we make sure that people stay on track with the contribution that they're making? And that is all part of contributing in a meaningful sense. So one of the things that I just spoke uh, a couple months ago for Gartner at their big Uh, annual conference in uh, Kochi, India, which was amazing. And one of the things I told the CIOs that were gathered there was, we need you to be a chief meaning at scale officer. Oh, (laughs) mic drop. Nice work. (laughs) Thank you. So I do think that that is probably the alignment between the CIO and the CHRO. It's a meaning and purpose kind of driver in both cases. It just takes on a little bit different function the way that it comes to life. So I would probably keep those roles separate. I would just make sure that they have in common that they're coming from that purpose place and that meaning place. Gosh, that's a great answer. And when I when I do do the transcript, I'm going to look between Viktor Frankl's book and this transcript to see how many times the word meaning was used. But yeah. I'm for it. I'm, I'm pro-meaning, Kate. Victor Frankl and I could probably have a meaning smackdown for how often we talk about meaning in a given couple of minutes. But I, love I, would, that. I would give it to Victor. I mean, he certainly earned it in his life. Indeed. <laughs> now, speaking of CHROs and CIOs and really the C-suite, you get to work with a lot of executives. These days, there is um, fodder, I would suppose you could use the term, around the terms of future of work, future of workplace, future of jobs, almost like future of fill in the blank. So specifically with jobs and workplace and work, can you help us distinguish for executives and for listeners and for leaders and for team members, what the heck's the difference, Kate, between future of work, future of workplace and future of jobs? Yeah, this was one of my going back and looking at my old writing sort of re- realizations. A few years back, uh, some some years back, I had made the realization that we talk a lot about the future of work and the future of jobs and a lot of other terminology without really distinguishing if there's any sort of nuance of difference or shade of difference in those words. Mm-hmm. And I really feel that there is. So most of the time when people approach me after a keynote and ask about the future of work, it's an executive or a leader who's thinking about the organizational view of, you know, how are we going to manage remote teams? What is the worker work uh, work uh, employer employee relationship going to look like? Sort of labor relations, that sort of view. How do we think about um, you know workflow in a distributed way and and that sort of thing. That's usually what falls under that. And of course, automation is a huge subtopic, we, robot, robotic process automation and, and the, the gathering storm of auto, artificial intelligence and what that's going to mean. And on the other side, I feel like the questions that come about the future of jobs really feel like they come from a much more human place, like a human anxiety place. Like what what is our job going to be in the future? What what kind of contribution will I be able to make? Like as as automation and AI and robots increasingly take over the workflow and the workplace, what what is it going to look like as a human to make a contribution in in work? And so I think it's very useful to disambiguate those concepts and be sure that we're asking the question on the right side of whatever equation and answering the question on the right side of the equation and and being conscious that there are questions on the other side of that equation. Mm. There's also the workplace. And that's a a discussion that I think we all got a much more visible insight into as a result of the COVID pandemic, when so many jobs were forced to be done from home or at least, you know, remotely from one another. Um, and that that I think started to really surface the questions about like how will we now 
deal with the the fact that the that Pandora's box has been opened and now so many people really want the freedom to work either from home or remotely or in a hybrid sort of arrangement. What does that mean? What does that mean? The meaning of place is for work. How do we value what it means to have an office or a campus or something like that if so few people are coming in and utilizing the space itself or or is that okay? You know, how do we make sure we're we're making the right investments there? So it's a very complex multi-part discussion. And I think it becomes maybe not that much less complex, but a little easier to navigate when we are using the right terminology for the right question and answer set. I love that. Okay. Well, like it's a good segue, I think, and it leads to a question I've always wanted to ask you. Maybe we have over some drinks in the past already, and I forgot the answer. But whether it's work or jobs or workplace, there's obviously, you know, a relationship in in your view and your research and your work between the human centricity or human centric approach and you know digital transformation or technology itself. So, what's that relationship, or what should we be looking out for in the future of fill in the blank when it comes to being human centric and the fact that we have this digital transformation uh, transformation happening all the time. I mean, it doesn't go away. We continue to innovate. Yeah, yeah. I think th there's there's two components to that. And it goes back to that trifecta that I mentioned earlier, the business, uh, technology, and humanity uh, sort of three-way three, three -way relationship. Right. And that is when you think about the business, the, the business drivers of digital transformation, we're thinking about being more efficient, more, you know, more operationally efficient, more um, uh, stable, more repeatable, more reliable, that sort of thing. Generally, what we're trying to do is figure out, you know, how do we create value in our relationship with people who are outside the organization? And how do we do that faster or more efficiently or more profitably? And using technology is oftentimes part of the answer to that question. But I think the the secret is pulling back to that relationship between business and human and, and trying to make sure we understand what is that purpose, what is the alignment that's really happening there, and then using technology in whatever form to amplify and enhance that alignment, as opposed to really just putting your foot on the gas in whatever way uh, technology seems like it's going to move the business. Mm. That's where I think, you know, human centric digital transformation uh, starts in, in my mind from that alignment between business and humanity, and really trying to make sure that alignment is front and center before moving forward. It, it the the worst thing that an executive can do is say uh you know we we want to use more technology. <laughs> you know, we here's a new technology that's out there. I, I saw a headline about cloud strategy and come to a, a VP and slap down a newspaper clipping in front of them and say what's our cloud strategy? <laughs> that's <laughs> not the way to digitally transform. But to start from saying we know that our value is in, you know, delivering reliable service to our customers and they want to be able to access from anywhere cloud seems like it's a way that's going to get us there and it's going to add to the value that we're providing like let's make sure that we're investing all in into cloud strategy that's 100 percent a much more sensible way to have that conversation what's our cloud strategy uh stormy weather ahead boss i mean uh yeah okay have you well, had that experience where in the past when in jobs where a boss has like put a clipping down in front of you and gone like, what are we doing about this? <laughs> yeah. Fill in the blank. Uh, LMS. Should we have one? What's a talent marketplace? Should we have one? <laughs> Just like an ad, ad infinitum. Absolutely. Flop sweat starts to appear. Like, well, okay. So, so speaking of which, let's, uh, the, the elephant in the room, the AI elephant in the room I wanted to ask you about, of course, is the recent explosion of chat GPT but also forthcoming what a lot of people aren't aware of is GPT-4, which is about chat GPT on about 50 million steroids. So before I ask you about the, what the cool kids are talking about with technology, I want to ask you about AI and chat GPT and specifically this human centricity and digital transformation kind of alignment that probably needs to be happening. And first, your thoughts just upon where are we now and what do you foresee going on the AI front? You know, I think that there's there's so many interesting developments in that space. It's going so fast. And I think what it's doing is forcing a lot of the conversations to happen in the mainstream that have been happening that have sort of bubbled up in tech ethics and sort of right. uh, these these spaces over the last five plus years that we've all been saying, hey, you know, we should be thinking about <laughs> making sure that uh, that we're 
putting the right data in to train these tools and th that we're not using biased data, for example, so that things get generated out of these generative AI tool sets that uh, that sound racist or wrong mm. or you know sexist or whatever. We've seen that with so many uh, visual generative sets. We've seen it now. We're seeing it now with the uh, the written sort of generative sets. Um, so so that's a conversation that that is very important, and it's it should be forcing a lot of um, should have been for forcing some soul searching already. Uh, hopefully, at a, at a larger level, it might start that conversation uh, being a, a much more visible one. Uh, but I think it, at a larger level, societally, I think there's a, a really interesting reckoning that people are having. On one hand, with how these tools could could enhance productivity, and people have been ex, uh, experimenting and dabbling and finding, oh, oh, they definitely can enhance my productivity. But I think we we also quickly learn the limits of that enhancement because it's never going to ch ChatGPT is not going to generate your writing. It's going mm. to generate a version of writing that might provoke you. I've, I've been saying, I've been using generative writing tools for a while now, and uh, the way I describe it is, it's a great writer's block overcomer. You know, it's if I'm if I'm having trouble on a sentence and like, oh, I'm just stuck, I don't know what to say, I just ask it to start at the next sentence. And usually it's completely wrong, but knowing what you don't wanna write is just as important as knowing what you do wanna write. <laughs> so that can usually kind of move you in the direction you wanna go. So I think it's a, a a learning curve that people are going to have to have with these tools and really sort of learn their own processes for creativity and for productive outcome and how AI is going to help us do that. There's of course the reckoning with, you know, how it can displace and replace labor in real ways. Um, and I think we we have not really had that in a really honest way uh, publicly. I think we, we've had a very, um, freaked out hair on fire version of that. And we've had a very dismissive version of it, but not the real like in between. Yes, both of those things are probably going to happen at some level. So we we need to understand what that looks like. Um, you know, some some real reckoning with uh, not only universal basic income and social kind of structures in place that that makes sense in a, in a world that has a lot of these AI tools uh, running around it. But also, as I point out on a regular basis, we talk a lot about universal basic income, but we don't talk about universal basic meaning. Uh, people make such a contribution and feel such a sense of who they are based on the work that they do. If you suddenly don't have a job that seems like a meaningful contribution, where will we get that sense of meaning? So I think that conversation is really important too in making sure that we're beginning that process at least of of having a very real conversation of what it means to live in a world that has a lot of these technology tools. So well said. And I think you're prescient because I wanted to segue into now uh, sort of a line of questioning or conversation I think we're having, a good old chit chat with Kate yeah. and Dan. And, and that is leadership's responsibility with the technology and be that as it may, AI, the chat GPTs, generative um, sets, you know, the ethics of the right gender of set, so there's no biases, et cetera. Where where does leadership play? And we can we can actually segue this further, and that is leadership of the organization. So that could be the senior leaders whom have to make conscious decisions on whether to use AI and in what instances. Is it to make more money? Is it to reduce costs? Is it to reduce the labor force? But then there's probably, I would argue, Kate, and you have, I'm sure, infinite amount of wisdom and insights into this because you are KO Insights, right? And that is government. So where does the government, whether it's federal or in cases state or provincial, et cetera, where do they need to play a part in the federation, if you will, of where technology is going? Yeah, I think at the business leader level, it really does come down to that that arrangement or that alignment between business objectives and human objectives and using technology to amplify the value that's created. If it means that there's a reduction in human labor in, in order to facilitate a more meaningful relationship with the human customers or you know entities outside of the, the organization, I think that's a fair and reasonable thing as long as we're having a very honest assessment of that. And it isn't you know sort of a greedy profit seeking, you know, reduction at all costs and, and profit at all costs kind of kind of a situation. 
Um, but I, I, I certainly don't advocate, you know, the the easy dismissal of human workers. I think it's it's something we have to take very seriously and, and be very cautious and conscious of. At the same time, I think new jobs get created by mm -hmm. these new technology classes. And that's that's something I think we haven't been uh, eyes open enough to and creative enough about, you know, what what types of new uh, oversight do these tools require? What types of new human nuance and emotional intelligence need to be wrapped around the the sort of processes that we automate within within the work workplace? So that's the one side. And yes, on the government side, I think that's uh, there's there's certainly huge implications for what needs to happen at all of the levels you mentioned, right? Like cities, localities, states, uh, provinces, um, and and country governance, but. That's going to be uh, obviously it's going to depend on the local threshold for, you know, what what people want to see put in place uh, and what what the voters sort of support. Um, but I think that by and large, there we're a little behind on on this kind of conversation and and that there's there's already a need for probably in, in most localities, uh, a, a more aware reckoning with the the existence of automation and intelligent technology tools. Uh, very few places have uh, recognition of facial recognition uh, in their in their law set, for example, right. you know, and and facial recognition is is rolling out so fast. You know, I'm, I'm a big Delta Airlines flyer and uh, they, they're now going to make that part of not only they've been using in their boarding process, but in an experimental way. And so it's easy enough to say, I opt out of this process. I'd like to be checked in the old fashioned way. Yeah. Um, but now it's actually, they're rolling it into how you order food on a plane and, you know, all this kind of stuff. They're going to, I, I gather from what they've announced that there are going to be cameras in the backs of the seats uh, wow. sort of facing you, which is uh, unsettling to think of a camera <laughs> looking at you the entire time you're on this plane. Right. Uh, it's just like this, this level of, of, surveillance that we're becoming inured to is is a little disconcerting and so actually my show the tech humanist show uh our last discussion with uh was about surveillance and and how that's coming becoming more pervasive and we're becoming you know more permissive of it so i think that's a that's a direction that we probably want to be a little more aware of if, if we decide culturally if you know groups groups of us decide that we want to allow this trade-off of conveniences for that level of surveillance or the security that we think comes along with it or whatever we may decide fine but i don't think that we're making that decision i think that law enforcement is making that decision i think mm -hmm. that business is making that decision at a sort of operational efficiency level um and those those are not conversations that are incorporating the larger public and including them in in what they feel is an appropriate risk to take or an appropriate trade-off in the long term one of the things you mentioned in this answer by the way was you know as long as we're aligned on the right intent essentially like meaning purpose like if we can align there then there's probably good as an outcome that will result yeah so I guess my second to last question for you is, well, what is it that organizations you see that are doing it well in that alignment, what do they do? What are the leaders actually, for purposes of your argument, taking the necessary steps to enact such an alignment? You know, it's so funny. Every time someone asks for good examples, I rack my brain for the last five or so examples that I might have used, and every one of them has encountered some sort of a PR gaffe in <laughs> the months since I brought them up. So nobody does it perfectly, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's that's just a given. Everybody is going to trip and fall, and you know, hopefully, what they'll do is you know pick themselves back up and reassess and figure out, refigure their alignment. But that alignment looks like, I think, in general, what that would look like if we had a great example to share is it would be looking at, you know, what is the experience that a person is looking to have with us, with our brand, what what's happening in their world? I think like, you know, Starbucks is an example. It's been sort of a classic for me for years because of when they launched mobile ordering through their app, yeah. they were pretty, pretty pioneering in that. Yeah. Uh, and and I, I loved that it was um, an experience that I, as a New Yorker, could really relate to the idea that I might be walking to an appointment or, you know, going to have a meeting with somebody might, Oh, it'd be nice to have a cup of coffee, you know, at my meeting. 
So I might order on my way. They show me a map. I, I can see like there are, of course, like eight Starbuckses in the three blocks between here and where I'm going. I can pick the most convenient one. I can customize my drink. I can do all the things that make it easy for me to understand because it's going to tell me uh, the drink will be ready in five to eight minutes. And this is a five to eight minute walk. Okay, perfect. We're, we're in sync. We're in alignment. I, a lot of that detail is the kind of thing that most people probably would never have thought to ask for um, if you ask them, you know, what would make your relationship with Starbucks more convenient. Um, but but the fact that they really studied the customer experience and they really thought about everything that was possible to optimize their business on the barista side, on the, the individual store side, and everything that's possible to optimize on the experience side. And they really looked for how to make that as seamless as possible. And you can tell that's why it's been so successful. And they've really, you know, flourished in the last few years. So well said. Great example. Uh, Kate, last question before we ask where we can find out more about you. Uh, in one of your books, A Future So Bright, you make a strong case, I think because you're an eternal optimist, for strategic optimism in the face really of a very uncertain future. So we've talked about future of work, future of jobs, future of workplace. We've talked about AI, ethics. Uh, what's optimistic for you as we're plodding through 2023 into 2024? <laughs> wow, we just started 2023, man. Can't we just be here for a minute? <laughs> You're a futurist. Come on. I am. I am. And just, I, I don't know about you, but on a human level, I'm feeling the drag from the holidays <laughs> still on me. So I got to shake that up and move forward. Um, you know, what I'm optimistic about is that uh, we are having the, the real conversations about things like climate, um, about AI. These these things are are having the their moment of... Um, you know, of widespread media attention. Um, mm -hmm. In the ter in case the case of the climate, you know, perhaps not as widespread and not as much of a moment as it's needed to for for quite some time now, but it is making progress. I mean, certainly there's a lot more headlines uh, in the last six months about climate change than there were in any six month period previously. I and mean, you could just feel that to be true. Um, so I think that that's a reason for optimism. People are paying attention to the things that matter. And in my definition, when I go back to talking about meaning as a human condition, I always summarize all those layers of meaning I talked about earlier. Meaning is always about what matters. And if we think about innovation, innovation is about what is going to matter. And that gives us a very human centric way to think about innovation. So if we're always thinking about what matters and what's going to matter, and we think about all the big existential issues in front of us, like climate change, like the geopolitical upheaval that you know is kind of out there. Um, if we think about AI and automation, if we think about uh, you know uh, privacy and cybersecurity issues, uh, all the things that are that are big, ponderous issues right now. I think as long as we can tackle them with our eye on that, what what matters and what's going to matter, one eye on now and one eye on the future. And really trying to solve with an alignment for the future, uh, solving for now, for humans now, as well as those in the future. I, I think we're, we're going to be in much better shape than we would be otherwise. And that's that's where I keep my optimism. How about you? You're an optimistic person. What's your <laughs> optimism going into 2024? <laughs> I, uh, I'm always human first. Put the humanness first. I have such faith that there are more good people on this planet than there are not. The knots get the fair share of the Pareto principle press and the negatory does impact many of us, but we just, we have to, as Leonard Cohen said, right? Uh, you know, there's light in the cracks, go find the light, go find those cracks. And just, there's, there's, there's a avalanche of humanity and lots of people know how to make the tech work in a more humane world. I do worry, but at the end of the day, I think good trumps evil, and I did that on purpose. Kate O'Neill, <laughs> KO Insights, The Knockout Punch. Where can we find out more about you, my friend? KOinsights.com is uh, one easy place to go. Uh, I used to tell people Twitter or Facebook or things like that, but, you know, who even does social media these days? <laughs> you can find me on LinkedIn, of course, but KO Insights, that'll get you everywhere. <laughs> awesome. Well, this has been such a treat, a delicious, scrumptious half an hour of wisdom, insights, and love. You, by the way, are someone who matters to me. And so please stay in my life, Kate. I uh, learned so much from you, and it's just uh, you just do such wonderful work, and you're helping so many people and organizations understand that 
in order to prosper with technology, you got to be human first. So thank you for that, Kate. Thank you, Dan. All right, everyone. Another episode of Leadership Now with me, Dan Pontefract. Today, Kate O'Neill. Visit koinsights.com for more information about the one and only Kate O'Neill. Thanks again, my friend, and see you next time.